Aloha and Aloha Friday, Stan the Energy Man here. Halfway through summer already, can you believe it? Just amazing. Well today, we're gonna talk about uh, something a little bit different. We're gonna talk a little bit of politics because it's been a crazy season. So today's political atmosphere is supercharged with the rhetoric. So how does the average American sort through all the sound bites, the hype, and get to the heart of the issues? Well today, our distinguished panel We'll break down a few of the energy-related topics so American voters can make their decisions based on sound logic and science. We have with us today Mr. Dr. Dave Molinero, who studied at the University of Baton Blanc in the French Riviera and did his thesis on alcohol consumption among juvenile canines in the Arctic. We also have with us Dr. Rachel James from the University of Bahamas, Ile de Rum, who did her thesis on dating habits of post-juvenile male Drosophila confined to high school petri dishes. And of course, I'm your host, Dr. Stan Osterman, University of Waimanalo, MIT, Makapu Institute of Te Teletherapy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> so now that we've got our credentials established, we're here to talk about what's really going on in politics. We're serious from here on out. So. <laughs> We have so much fun at work, we just have to continue on the show here today. Oh, okay. So thanks to our show, <laughs> but we really are going to talk about, about important stuff oh. today. We're going to talk a little bit about climate change and, and some of the things going on in our world that have to do with uh, politics and uh, talk about energy and politics. So really, this is Dave Molinero and Rachel James. Both of them work with me at HCAT, and uh, we thought we'd have a little bit of fun there, so I hope you enjoyed it. Anyway, welcome to the show. Good to have both of you here. And uh, let's, let's, you know, we, we deal with energy day in and day out, all day long, all kinds, transportation, grid, everything. So let's talk a little bit about some of the things that we're, we're working every day. And I wrote a bunch of questions down here that have to do with some of the things we're looking at. So let's start with Alexa. Is Alexa up? Alexa, what's weather change or climate change? Uh oh, she's not listening anymore. Right, okay, well, well, we'll talk about climate change. The first question I'd, I'd like to discuss is Is climate change real and is it man made? So, Rachel, what do you think? Is it, I mean, are we making a lot to do about nothing? Is this something that naturally happens in cycles or are all the scientists really just out there, you know, saying, all this stuff for nothing. What, what's going well, on? So s climate change does happen naturally. Um, and so the conversation about climate change is less whether or not climate change is man-made, but the pace at which the climate is changing. Um, so it's certainly been changing at a pace that's been induced by human activity. So I'd say yes, okay. climate change is natural. Yes, it's exacerbated by our activity. Okay. Doctor, I agree, agree with you as well on that uh, assessment. I okay. think climate change is definitely real. Uh, I think humankind has contributed significantly to that uh, natural trend of uh, heating the climate okay. and global co climate change. I so. think we can all agree on that. The, the one interesting thing to point out, though, is a lot of times people take statistics and they kind of change a little bit here, and it has a whole different meaning. So there's an old saying that there's lies, um, damn lies, and statisticians. So when you hear something like nine out of 10 scientists agree that climate change is caused by man, with, and, but really what the survey said was nine out of 10 scientists agree that man has a role in climate change. Mm -hmm. It's two totally different things. So on the side that says climate change is, is like everything and man's doing everything, they lock onto the nine out of 10 scientists say man caused climate change. Mm -hmm. That's really not what the survey said. And on the other side, it's like, that's all bogus stuff. It's not really what the thing said. And then you have the arguments. Agreed. So what we need to do is get past those arguments and talk about, like you said, Rachel, we have a role in it. It's obvious we have a role in it because our cars pollute. Yes. Like I said on one of my shows and you found it entertaining, you wouldn't wrap your lips around your <laughs> exhaust pipe and start breathing that stuff. It's not you good wouldn't. for you. So if you, don't, if you wouldn't breathe it right off of your car, what makes it good for the atmosphere and the climate? So next question would be, so why should the U.S. do anything about it? When, you know, look at our, our sky, look at our background, look at in Hawaii, we're, we're nice and clean and pristine all the time, but then look at India or China or some other big industrial countries and it's ugly. So what's the U.S.'s role in climate change? You know, what, what, why should we be bur taking all the burden on ourselves and forcing ourselves to do carbon credits and all this stuff? Um, so 
and in the climate change discussion particularly, I'm a big fan of we should do better because we know how to do better. Um, and so waiting for someone to verify or confirm that climate change is happening or say that we're contributing to it, we have the technology and um, we have the expertise, we have the opportunity to do better and so we should. So for me, that's really kind of the beginning and the end of the discussion. Um, but on a global scale, um, similarly, we have an opportunity to be at the forefront of doing things a better way. And because climate change impacts the globe, um, it's important that everybody kind of play a part and we have all the tools at our disposal. So we have but to use them. Dave? I'd like to add on to what uh, Rachel said. I think we do have the technology and the skills. Um, I think more importantly, the United States has demonstrated leadership and has the leadership and must continue to demonstrate the leadership to uh, to, to counteract the changes in the in the climate right now. Um, I think that's probably the key. I, I'd agree with you there, and I, and I think that's really what the U.S. should be taking the lead, and, and even Hawaii. Hawaii should be taking the lead. People look to Hawaii as a pristine place mm -hmm. and a place that should be kept naturally be beautiful for visitors and things. So even more than the regular continental United States, the, the folks in Hawaii have a natural bent towards a great climate, and we ought to be leading the way and helping the U.S. lead the way. So our role shouldn't be to, to dictate it, but I think as Americans, we should take our responsibility as leading the way in climate change and showing the way it could be and should be, um, and make it economically profitable too. I think that's another piece. A lot of times folks you know, attach climate change to, well, it's not cost effective. You know? right. I mean, we've got this fossil fuel, it's cheaper, let's just use that. And, they, and, and then on the other side, you've got, but it's dirty and it's, you know, you guys are just being greedy and you get into the argument about, you know, what to do. But there's a medium in there where you can make the change and make it economically viable and lead the way also. And maybe that's the, the road we should take. So how should we do it? How should we try and, how, Hawaii particularly, how should Hawaii try and lead the way in climate and, and solving climate change issues and, and leading the way in, in uh, renewable energy in particular? I think we should do it with both hands in the air going as fast as we can and we should say woo as we're doing it. Um, but more seriously, um, <laughs> I Super think Hawaii, woman. yeah, we should do it that way. Um, no, I mean, Hawaii, we're, we are primed not only because we're an island and we need to, um, but because we have the intellect, we have the will, we have the historical knowledge, um, we have the ancestral knowledge here of a people practicing how to live in tandem with the environment. Um, so we have a really strong basis upon which to build. Sure, the, the key word that you hear nowadays is sustainability. Mm -hmm. and, and that's exactly right. A, a hundred years ago, the Hawaiians had a sustainable yep. agriculture and environment and fisheries, you know, and set the example a hundred years ago. So why can't Hawaii lead the way today? So Dave, what are some of the ways you think that Hawaii could lead? I think it, uh, Hawaii is leading the change right now. Again, as you mentioned, the uh, 2045 uh, mandate for renewable energy for electric production is exactly, absolutely huge. Exactly. That, that shows uh, an understanding, a collective understanding of the state, um, not only by the government, but the people that live here. We are on an island, uh, and I think we understand probably more than most people throughout the world that uh, we have limited resources, and we need to protect those resources and do everything in our power to make that happen. And I think that goes back to your point of leadership, too. I mean, um, a good leader uh, just doesn't have to sit there and ram things down on people, but just say, look, we need to set the example. And I think you're right. Gen uh, Governor Ige, almost called him General Ige, Governor, <laughs> Governor Ige sent a great example, and the legislature, by setting the 100% renewable by, by 2045 was just like, that reverberated around the world. Mm -hmm. Now people look to Hawaii and go, wow, that's really aggressive. Yeah. And I think that's the kind of thing we need to do. So <clears throat> really what we've basically said is, you know, climate change isn't man-made, I'm sure we contribute to it. And, and no matter whether you think it's a natural recurring cycle or whether you're contributing to it on a massive scale, the right thing to do is just to start living cleaner and have our, our technologies cleaned up. Um, Industries cleaned up, uh, oceans and rivers and, and um, streams cleaned up, and our highways, our tra transportation sector needs to get clean. And not just the cars, the airplanes, the boats, and, uh, and work towards a cleaner environment. So is climate change important? It certainly is. I mean, it's definitely been getting warmer this year. Whether it's a natural cycle or not, we'll get through it and we'll live through it. But we should always just be focusing on doing what we can do to preserve our environment and preserve our natural beauty, especially here in Hawaii. So we're going to take a quick break here and come back and talk about some other topics on 
energy and what we can do about it to go cleaner and greener. Aloha, I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, host of Sustainable Hawaii. Every Tuesday at noon, we talk about issues important to Hawaii's sustainability, the issues of conservation, renewable energy, uh, land management, food and energy security, and other issues that are extremely important as the World Conservation Congress approaches in the first week of September, and next year's World Youth Congress that's taking place here that's focusing on sustainability as well. Please tune in, join us as we highlight all the good things that are happening to achieve sustainability in Hawaii. Mahalo. Hello, and I'm Patrick Bratton. Please join me for Global Connections every Thursday at 1 p.m. where we talk with a variety of guests about various international uh, issues, historical issues, both here in Hawaii and abroad, range from security, human rights, ethics, and all sorts of other things. So please join me. I look forward to talking with you and seeing some of my guests. Hey, welcome back to my lunch hour. Actually, it's our lunch hour, because we're all from HCAT. Stan the Energy Man here with Rachel James and Dave Molinero, my crew at HCAT. Uh, we deal with energy and uh, renewable resources all day long and sustainability, so we're here to talk to you a little bit about it today. And uh, I think we finally got Alexa to work. So, Alexa, what's climate change? How come she did it two seconds ago and now she's not doing it? She's camera shy. I'm telling you, we've got to get our computers <laughs> going here. They're letting us down. Okay, Alexa, what is climate change? Global warming and climate change are terms for the observed century scale rise in the average temperature of the Earth's climate system and its related effects. There, there you go, but I don't know if I'd want to count on technology to save the world if that's how this is going to go. <laughs> but <laughs> at least we try there. That's Alexa, our studio uh, computer that knows everything. So let's talk a little bit about um, energy security and energy resiliency in, in, uh, in Hawaii and in the U.S. You know, a lot of people talk about energy security in terms of where we buy our fossil fuels and making sure that we can keep the price where we want it and things like that. And then, of course, we work with the military, and in the military, energy security is, hey, when I need the energy on on my base to do my mission, it better be there because I, I can't have a cyber attack or something take down my, my power, and I lose power to all my cri mission-critical assets. So what are the, some, of the, um, so some of the things about um, energy security and energy resiliency that, uh, that you think are? I'm going to start with Dave this time. Yes. It is absolutely imperative that we become energy independent as a nation. We have relied too long on fossil fuels from foreign entities, uh, foreign entities that we've had to go fight wars uh, in support of. And uh, you know, you're a former general officer in the military. Uh, I served a long time in the military as well. We know firsthand the cost of not being energy independent um, from the human perspective. Terrible losses, terrible um, uh, family um, challenges that are induced by that. But there's also an economic and a, um, economics, the economics of making that happen where we are not uh, um, shelling out money to foreign entities, foreign countries uh, to provide energy, result, uh, energy to us. Got to change. How about you, Rachel? Um, yeah, um, energy security is paramount, um, but when I think about security, I think a lot about developing nations, um, and because so much of the push is to replicate what first world nations are doing, um, much of everyday life is dependent on something that has some sort of an energy draw. Um, and so in a sense of security for a town or a city or a small community, like to run your city, you're going to need energy, and if you can't have reliable energy, like the rest of your systems are very likely to fail. Um, and so, from just a development standpoint, with the population growing so rapidly and everybody pushing for what we have here in the West, um, it's very, very important that people look to being independent in their energy production and storage and all the movement. But they need to be able to contain and maintain it. Okay, so so on the mainland, there's all kind of sources of energy. You got mm. you've got. Um, uh, hydroelectric dams that are producing a lot of really cheap energy and nuclear power plants which we don't have in Hawaii for probably really good reasons yeah. I think here um, you know and so electrical energy can be relatively cheap and renewable and it is many places on the mainland um, but here in Hawaii we're, we're basing a lot of ours on fossil fuel either mostly petroleum but to most people's surprise coal mm. uh, I think about 10 percent of our electricity here is generated by coal which is a great natural resource that we have in the U.S. and gives us energy independence. 
but comes with other costs that people are, real, are really cautious of. Mm -hmm. well, and then the transportation side. You know, the U.S. uses more uh, gasoline and fuel oil by far than any other Western country or any other country. I think e even if we produced all our own domestic oil and natural gas and, mm -hmm. and everything, we would have a hard time meeting the demand, especially as energy requirements grow. Right. I mean, we're not gonna sit here and only need this much energy now. We're actually gonna start needing more and more, exactly. as will China, as will India. So what are some of our options? I mean, if, even if we all started driving plug-in electric cars right now, is that, is that realistic or hydrogen cars right now? I mean, how fast can you switch to a technology like that, and, and how do we how do we eat that elephant? You know, how do we make that change um, and make it work, make it real? I think we have to combat or change 100 plus years of mindset with uh, fossil fuel consumption. Uh, we also have to adapt and modify infrastructure that's developed over those over the past century, century and a half. Uh, that have supported uh, fossil fuels. So will battery cars, uh, will hydrogen fuel cell vehicles uh, dominate in the next you know, decade or two? Probably not, but you have to start somewhere and you've got to start today. Rachel? Yes, you eat an elephant one bite at a time. Um, and so we have to take those bites. Um, and so that's part, you know, electric plug-ins, that's part hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, um, but that's a large part of cultural change. And a lot of it's information and helping people understand their impact on the globe and not just in a do good thing so people live better, but a very tangible, if you change this habit, it will have dramatic impact on the atmosphere. Um, so I think getting that message out, um, that's incremental change, but that's lasting change. And so that cultural shift, I think, will help support the technology transformation that'll happen over the next few decades. I don't think people understand what capabilities we have right now with battery and photovoltaic. Uh, hydrogen fuel cells and uh, even biodiesel biofuels mm -hmm. and they just it, it's a matter of education I know Rachel and I talk about that a lot at the office about how to get that message out how to become a, a, a change agent to help people understand what really uh, what uh, technologies are out there now that we can use to start that change so what's the big shift gonna be to you got the Elon Musk on one side saying batteries and you've got you know Toyota on the MRI saying it's gonna be hydrogen fuel cell vehicles so is it an either or? Is it an all of the above? And who's gonna who's gonna pick up the pace and and kind of do the long haul? What do you think, Rachel? Oh, I'm like Dr. David. What do you think? <laughs> no, um, I, I, it's all of the above, truly. Um, but a lot of it has to do with infrastructure. And so, whatever in the all of the above will encompass either existing infrastructure and a trajectory to fast pace a change, or if it's if a place has an opportunity to establish brand new what the future is going to be, um, then that infrastructure has to be there. And so as we talk about educating people and making sure people like the common folk are aware of what's capable, it's really important that our legislators, our leaders are aware of what's necessary for not only the country, but for states and what their capabilities are um, and what they are proficient at already and what they can easily transition toward. So laying that foundation, I think, is important and that will really dictate how fast the transformation takes place. And, and what's the relationship going to be as we try and go to 100% renewables on the grid to trying to go closer to renewables in transportation. I mean, mm -hmm. we've made that point before that they're now interconnected. Right. If you have plug-in vehicles on your grid, that can be energy storage, mm -hmm. sure. as well as a draw on the grid, as well as a load when you need to, to shed renewable energy. Mm -hmm. You know, so plug-ins have that role. So, you know, how do we how do we get to that point where maybe the grid and the and the and the um, transportation sector are closer? What kind of things should we be looking at? You want to add that one, Dave? Well, um, the microgrid that we're, that's curl, currently under development at Hickam uh, through AFRL, as you're in, in, intimately familiar with, is, uh, I, I think, going to be a great R&D project to help demonstrate uh, how those technologies can transfer um, from uh, just a microgrid to uh, perhaps communities, um, city and county of Honolulu, perhaps nationwide as well. So um, we're not sure what that grid all those technologies will be and what the capabilities uh, that uh, might uh, be there from that grid, uh, but that there's some certain adaptability that will come from it. Okay, Rachel? Um, certainly having the conversation between departments is essential. So, I mean, now we converse regularly with the Department of Transportation. We speak with HECO. Um, we speak to community leaders from various walks of life, um, as well as who chair various committees. Um, so we have strong support there and people being more open to having a more diverse conversation and not so siloed. Um, so I think that's an important first step. 
And then the other side is those, those small bites of the elephant. And so if we talk about hydrogen and we want to talk about hydrogen as this go-between between transportation and energy, um, electricity side, then we can talk about implementing things like hydrogen grills or propane dispension, but also having hydrogen as an option. And so integrating these new technologies into people's everyday lives is important to start that infrastructure development. Um, and then as the technologies come on board, so like with fuel cell vehicles, as that technology advances and more vehicles are available, there's already that seeding of technology within that infrastructure development and wherever the community that's adopting it's gonna be. So here in Hawaii, we are primed to generate our own hydrogen. We have such uh, depth of available renewable resources that we can generate that cleanly. Um, and so if we can start there and start placing these new technologies in people's regular day-to-day -day activities, um, that's just the basis for change. So part of that cultural change and then part of that developing the infrastructure. So I think that you have to have that segue to be able to make lasting change. Okay, let's, let's pull that thread a little bit further then. Okay. You know, right now we have Hawaiian Electric as a publicly regulated yep. um, electric utility. We have Hawaii Gas as a public re publicly regulated utility. A mon both of them are monopolies, mm -hmm. and they're regulated publicly because they are monopolies, yep. and they serve the people of Hawaii. Are we going to see a shift from electricity to gas of some kind? And if so, is it going to be natural gas, liquid natural gas, or should it, should we go right to hydrogen or you know, what, what kind of options do you think we have there? That's the education piece yeah, for me. I, I mean, and as a publicly regulated utility, the public should have a voice. Um, but the decision makers, so our commissioners in the PUC, and it's great because I see so many of them out there um, having these conversations with one another, but also with community members as well as with people in the industry. Um, so providing that information for what the people of Hawaii want is really important to make informed decisions. And so what the answer will be, I don't think should be up to an entity to identify, I think it should be a collective effort, but it's necessary that people have the knowledge available to them to make informed choices. Right. I think too, to add to what Rachel said, we need to really, this is going to be a difficult change no matter what, um, going from fossil fuels. If we continue to rely on natural gas or fossil fuels for power generation, transportation, that's, not, that's, that's the easy solution. I think we've really got to stretch and push um, our leadership nationally and locally to help facilitate that change and um, help lead that transformation. Uh, there, we really can't go backwards. We've come so far, the technology's there. Again, it's about demonstrating the leadership mm -hmm. uh, at all levels, um, within our schools, within the community leadership, uh, at the national level, we've got to press forward. So, so let me pull that a little further too. Is the technology really there? Are we really ready to make those changes? I mean, do you, do you really feel like, like hydrogen is there? We could put it in people's stoves and, and water heaters and things that, that uh, propane or other natural gas products are used for now? You know, when President Kennedy in, at the beginning of the, uh, in the 1960s said, we're going to go to the moon by the end of the decade, I don't think he had any idea what the space shuttle or the spaceships would look like, what the program is going to look like. Um, but we knew the technology was, was there, it was being developed. That's the same mindset I think we have to have now. I think you're right. I think you're really, really right on. And we had some great uh, meetings this week with uh, the folks in the military side out at Hickam with the Apprise conference that, um, that was put on by PACOM. And we learned a lot out there too. And, and I think the technology is there. Um, an, an interesting thing we, we saw at the conference or we, we heard was uh, the technology um, um, advisors to the, to the major commands were there. And the, uh, the Navy SEAL that was there advising the special ops community um, he pointed out too that lithium batteries are great. Mm -hmm. They are, they're, they're great, they're, they're light, they can do everything, but there's one big problem. You can't put them on a ship. You can't put them on a submarine because lithium is considered a hazardous material when you ship it or move it. And the Navy and the military in, in general have really tight protocols on making sure things pass certain wickets before you'll put them in a, a, a multi-billion dollar ship or, or on a, a multi-multi-million dollar aircraft. So you have to look at the technologies and see not only that it's new and it's great and, and, it's, and it's current, you know, we can do it, but does it fit? Mm -hmm. So is that part there? Is, are, are we really ready to shift to a new gas and a new way of storing electricity and, you know, with hydrogen? Are we, are we ready for that? 
I'd say that we're on the cusp of shifting. But I mean, so change can happen a number of ways. Primarily, it can happen because you push the change, and then catastrophe will force you to change. Um, so it would be preferred if we didn't wait for the catastrophe um, that we press ahead with the knowledge that we have. But certainly, those regulations aren't fully in place. Um, it's not standard across the board for how we implement use of these different technologies um, and helping people understand how to mitigate the I mean, health and safety concerns of using different materials in different ways, those things are not fully vetted. But if we wait for a catastrophe to happen and then try to figure it out, it's not to say that it will be any safer at that time. Mm -hmm. So I, I think of flexing your muscles and building them, and you don't get bigger muscles if you don't flex them a bit. So, right. you know, as we have these technologies, we have to use them, we have to push it to their limit, and they should fail, and we should learn from those failures um, and fail forward. So. And the irony that hit me when the... <coughs> when the um, the SEAL was talking about the he can't get the batteries mm. on, the, on the submarine was the fact that the submarines have electrolyzers in them yeah. not to make hydrogen make they get rid of the hydrogen yeah. they're making oxygen for the crew on the submarine using an electrolyzer and they've been doing it for decades mm -hmm. so that system is already proven technology on right. a ship where they have really tight stringent you know controls right. and yet they could be saving the hydrogen and putting it in like hydride storage mm -hmm. and having that capacity instead of batteries for their seals right so in the discussions we had this this past week it's actually been all of the technologies all around us and yep. it's sometimes you got to cross over and Agreed. talk to people about well this guy uses electro electrolysis for oxygen mm -hmm. he never thought of using hydrogen in his batteries for energy storage as energy storage and it's something that's a natural for submarines so you're right I think uh, I think we have the technology so here's the big question, and I want you to predict. Uh -oh. We got fossil fuels that are good for a long time yet. We're not going to run out like this week or this month. But how far ahead do we have to start to make sure we have that next generation of energy ready to go? I mean, do, do we really need a, a long head start, like decades, or you know, how fast? When when the president when President Kennedy said we're going to go to the moon in a decade, you know, how how fast is fast enough or realistic to to make the change? change has to be done in big increments. You, incremental change usually doesn't succeed in whether it's a sports team or business or whatever entity. It's got to be, it can't be incremental or you fall backwards. So I, I think we've got to start now, continue on that path. Um, we have the technology, again, we've certainly got the leadership and the infrastructure and some uh, capable assets uh, throughout the United States to, to implement things. And yeah, let's start now. Okay, how about you, Rachel? Go big or go home. That's good. You gotta do it now. <laughs> uh, I agree. <laughs> and I would only say we just gotta pace ourselves because, you know, we do have to think about jobs and keeping people employed. If you if you went to all microgrids and lost the grid, all those linemen are out of jobs. I mean you have to think of how you're gonna transition people's careers and things as we make these changes. So anyway, we covered a lot. We hope we had a good discussion that'll help you think about what to think about with climate change and energy security in the United States. And hopefully that'll make your decision on politics a little easier this year. So until next week, when I'll be talking to uh, the guy who runs Proton on site, one of the manufacturers of hydro hy um, hydrogen uh, electrolysis equipment, we'll see you then on Stan Energy Man. Aloha.